distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for coming to the Forum on Religious Harmony. As we are about to start soon, this is just a gentle reminder, please put your mobile devices to silent mode. Uh, just a reminder as well that, that today's proceedings will be taped and put up on the IPS social media platforms. The event is open as well for full media coverage. It now gives me great pleasure to welcome IPS Senior Research Fellow, Dr. Matthew Matthews, to deliver his opening remarks. Dr. Matthews, please. Thank you, Leonard. A uh, very warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today uh, for this IPS Forum on Religious Harmony. I especially want to acknowledge our gratitude to Mr. Wong Kan Singh, uh, former Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Home Affairs, who has agreed to engage us later on in a, I hope, very exciting panel discussion. Uh, we're also very privileged to have many uh, senior civil servants as well as senior uh, religious leaders from the different faith communities. Uh, we also welcome uh, international scholars who are also here with us who have joined us who are in a symposium at SMU right now. Uh, before we proceed uh, with the panel discussion uh, we've arranged today, allow me to provide a little context of why we are having a forum on religious harmony in the context of the issues that we are dealing with. Uh, very well known, internationally known, that Singapore has very high levels of religious diversity. Uh, we've got good representation of all the main world religions uh, in Singapore. And among those who hold on to a religion, which is about 80% of our population, uh, a great proportion of them have a strong sense of belonging to uh, their religious affiliation. And if you look at the chart that it comes from, our IPS survey on race, language and religion, we sampled over 4,000 Singaporeans couple of years ago, and if you notice the figures for those who are especially uh, Christian and Muslim, very, very high uh, proportion who feel a strong affiliation to religious beliefs. But despite that, despite the fact that uh, we've got lots of diversity, a strong sense of religious identity, uh, there's a general perception that religious harmony prevails. So few Singaporeans, as this chart will show, uh, have experienced religious insults, uh, other forms of religious tensions on a regular basis. If you, uh, you probably won't be able to see the small uh, lettering there, but uh, I mean, only 58%, nearly 60% of respondents say that they have never experienced someone insulting their religious belief. And 22% uh, say rarely have experienced that. So in, in general, uh, very few people feel this on a basis, a very common, often basis. At the same time, we also know that many Singaporeans in general believe that uh, religious harmony is part of life in Singapore, uh, and uh, nearly about two-thirds of our respondents feel that. And uh, the rest who don't feel that, most of them uh, at least somewhat agree to the statement that in Singapore people of different religious uh, religions live in harmony. But despite all those rosy results, uh, among a third of Singaporeans uh, say that there are concerns that increasing religiosity can hurt religious harmony in Singapore and about another quarter, at least somewhat, agreed to that. Uh, in our surveys, we never managed to ask respondents why they feel that uh, that's the case, why increasing religiosity can cause uh, some kind of religious discord. But as we kind of converse with many uh, practitioners of religion in Singapore and over many, many different projects, uh, we have a sense of an understanding about this. Increasing religiosity uh, could mean that some take on religious identity, uh, which is maintained by clearly defining themselves against the other. Uh, in, simple, in simple terms, we are good, the others are evil. Uh, then this results in an attempt to denigrate the beliefs and practices of the religious other. It could also mean enacting rigid social boundaries between people which reduce our common space. So we keep people out of our businesses, we don't en allow them to enter into our homes, uh, we don't join them in the festivities, uh, especially if they're not of the same religion as us. Last year, there was, in the Straits Times, there was an article about a laundrette in Johor Bahru, uh, which caused quite a stir when it said it would not serve non-Muslims, uh, so that clothes belonging to Muslims would not be mixed uh, with Muslims. Of course, increasing religiosity of a society does not have to be accompanied by all these negativities. Uh, it really depends on prevailing social norms. In Singapore, we are very fortunate that despite high levels of religiosity, few Singaporeans, at least publicly, insult other religious beliefs or engage in practices to exclude others from their lives. In fact, based on our surveys, uh, those who are highly religious were just as likely 
to state their comfort with people who are religiously different for a good number of social relationships. Tolerance and accommodation have been norms that many Singaporeans hold dearly. Uh, these social norms have greatly shaped the operation of religious institutions in Singapore. Uh, to at least at some extent, these social norms have been established because we have policy in Singapore uh, guiding issues of, to do with religion. I won't belabor the point about the kind of policies and programs that are in place in Singapore to promote religious harmony, but as you can notice some of the words there, which are very familiar to most of us, uh, Singapore does have a robust framework for multi-racial and religious relations. And uh, this includes due recognition to different cultural and religious groups in Singapore, whether it's in the observance of different festivals, public holidays for key religious groups. Uh, Singapore ensures that these things uh, made, uh, are provided for. Uh, we have the ethnic integration policy, for instance, that ensures that Singaporeans live in close proximity to those of different ethnic groups and by default then people who are religiously different too. Uh, the Sedition Act has been used before. It takes to task people who have insulted uh, people of other racial or religious backgrounds. Uh, the Maintainers of Religious Harmony Act, which came into effect a good number of years ago, gives power to the government to stop religious leaders from preaching or inciting religious hatred or mixing religion with politics. We also have the interracial and religious confidence circles, which was established a number of years ago which networks religious and community leaders together and further works to strengthen this multicultural ethos. Uh, through these platforms, religious leaders from different religious backgrounds become familiar with the beliefs of, of other faiths, but most of all, have been able to have meaningful connections with religious leaders of other traditions. Uh, this has made it much easier when it comes to religious tensions. Uh, you can see from the uh, slide there, uh, there were recent incidents last year and this year, uh, which have happened, which have caused at least some tension. Uh, one of uh, Imam Nala and the other one more recently of Pastor Lou Engel. And uh, when infractions have happened, these religious networks have kicked in. Religious leaders who felt responsible for breaking prevailing norms apologized, and religious leaders whose communities could have been insulted graciously extended forgiveness. For many religious leaders in Singapore value and work to preserve religious harmony, that cannot be said of all religious leaders elsewhere. In some societies, uh, there is substantial antagonism and suspicion. Religious leaders who operate in these settings sometimes are perpetrators of such antagonism or inadvertently disseminate messages which exacerbate rifts between communities. Most of us have, would have heard about monks and clerics, especially in the region, who have been using social media to heighten inter-religious tensions between communities. In fact, last year in Singapore, the authorities banned five foreign Muslim and Christian preachers from entering the country because their views were not compatible to the maintenance of religious harmony in Singapore. The other trends uh, that will have a bearing on religious harmony here. Over the last few years, Singaporeans of faith have been exposed not only to what goes on locally, but what goes on internationally. Singaporeans are firmly plugged in to religious practices and teaching uh, which go on elsewhere. Uh, both because, of course, we've got high penetration of the internet here and a lot of Singaporeans use social media, but also because uh, as a country we welcome uh, many from outside Singapore who also worship the same temples, mosques and churches as we do. In all these ways, uh, I mean, many of these ways, these interactions are very positive and they add dynamism to people's faith that's the context. This is a context which requires us to continue our discussion on religious harmony, an important fundamental for Singapore's long-term social stability. It is clear that maintaining religious harmony will require both the cooperation of the community as well as state mechanisms. So this forum thus will examine the role of both this, uh, both local religious leadership and how local religious leadership play a part in maintaining such a uh, form of religious harmony and also how the government plays a part in this. So it's my privilege then to, to begin with the first panel. And we have five panelists here who are distinguished uh, leaders from their religious communities. And I'll be inviting them on stage in just a few moments. Uh, they don't need a long introduction, and they're very familiar to many of us here. But they are, you can read their detailed bios uh, in your program sheet. But let me just uh, invite them to 
come on stage as I call for them. Uh, Bishop Emeritus Dr. Robert Solomon, who is the Methodist Church of Singapore. Reverend Mon Monsignor Philip Hing, who is Vicar General of the Finance and Administration and Interreligious Relations of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Singapore. Dr. Nazruddin Mohamed Nasir, who is Senior Director of Religious Policy and Development at MUIS. Thank you. Mr. S. Ramesh, Secretary of the Hindu Advisory Board. And Venerable Shi Yao Wei, who is Chairman of the Education Committee of the Singapore Buddhist Federation. We're very privileged to have our five uh, distinguished religious leaders who are up on stage with me and uh, uh, we'll be asking them to share their thoughts for a couple of minutes. They'll share for about five minutes first and just give some overview about their thoughts about the role of religious leadership in uh, preserving religious harmony in Singapore. After that, we'll have a little dialogue and then you'll get a chance to ask questions to uh, a panel here and uh, we'll get into a good discussion to together. So if I can begin uh, right from Venerable Shi, if you don't mind, you can just begin our sharing for a few minutes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Wong, and all guests and scholars, and, and to the re fellow religious leaders as well. Uh, actually, I was expecting to be the last. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, first bomb of the day. <laughs> anyway, um, I'll be representing uh, the Buddhist faith, uh, quite obvious. Um, Buddhism is one of the earliest uh, religions in the world. And uh, lately, there has been um, a kind of a change in a direction that uh, Buddhism is more than a religion. It's also a philosophy, and it's also a way of life. So um, the role of Buddhist Sangha, uh, we have to deal with uh, the change in mindset, change in followers, and also change in the environment. So I would like to quote a paper by Venerable Dhammapala. Um, he highlighted certain roles of the Buddhist Sangha in the 21st century. Um, primarily, Buddhist monks are supposed to be Dharma teachers. So the first role will be of a teacher. Um, we are supposed to um, read, digest, memorize, and go through texts, the Buddhist canons and the Buddhist texts, uh, not only in areas of Dharma, but also in areas of uh, the Vinaya, which are the rules uh, of how monks and nuns live. Also, this would also involve uh, rules of how monks, monastics, uh, engage the laity and how laity should deal with monks. So this is the primary role of a Buddhist monastic, that of a teacher, uh, teaching not only the Dharma and also teaching how to live our life. So number two, we also have a role to, to be a forest monk or forest dealer, which means we are supposed to be very good at what we are supposed to do. See, Buddhist monks, they are slightly different from uh, the laity. It's, it's in the sense that we have uh, chosen to renounce uh, our common life and uh, follow Dharma strictly. So there are certain rules, uh, what we can do and what we cannot do. So that role uh, is more to ourselves. We have to um, fulfill our role as a monk. So that is, um, there are two traditions actually. Uh, one in, in the Theravada traditions, we call them the for forest dwellers or the cave dwellers. These monks will live uh, in renunciation and uh, probably they, most of them will engage in ascetic uh, practices, which means they do not engage too many people uh, from the common society. And uh, these people, they will also um, purposely not involve themselves in uh, social media or email or telephone or things like that. So very much like a hermit. The other tradition would be uh, what we call the city monks, people like myself, we live in the city and we are supposed to engage um, laity on behalf of this forest dwellers. Yeah, so that's the two main categor cat categorization of monks. Um, there are also another category of monks who engage in more academic studies and they only do um, academic studies and they do not involve themselves too much with uh, rituals and or day-to-day -day, uh, running of the temples 
or even engagement of uh, laity. Yeah, so there are several categorization of uh, monks uh, in, in our society today. Um, number three, our third role will be to teach um, mind coming uh, lessons or mind coming uh, instructions to reduce stress. Yeah, so uh, this, is, this is catching on, especially in the Western part of the world. Uh, monks are very well, uh, very sought after um, to give instructions on meditation, on mindfulness, on uh, how to reduce stress, although this is creating a lot of stress on the monks. <laughs> Sometimes we just don't know how to talk to people. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, how to get away from, from daily living, yeah, even though we are, you know, we are not very good at getting away from daily living, yeah. So this is another broad aspect. We're supposed to engage people on how to reduce stress. I wonder how, but yes, that's the, another fact. And uh, this will also involve uh, like uh, parent-children counseling, um, husband and wife mediation. Yeah, so this would be more in contradiction to what uh, our monastic vows are. Okay, we are supposed to not engage so much, but now we are supposed to adopt a role where we are supposed to mediate between family members or husband and wife, parents and children. Yeah. Lastly, uh, one of the, the other last point highlighted in this paper would be we are supposed to be hmm, eye counselors or eye mediators or eye religious leaders, meaning we are supposed to stay in our eye abbot. Uh, I temple and provide instructions 24/7, hmm, like 7-Eleven. Yeah. So as when as as when uh, devotees would like uh, uh, to to ask a certain questions, they will drop it into our Facebook account or drop it into our email, and we are supposed to answer as quickly as possible. Yeah. Or now with the prevalence of uh, the mobile phone, we are supposed to also respond to um, WhatsApps and things like that. Yeah, so it's kind of like a myriad of uh, things we are supposed to do. Yeah, though primarily we are supposed to be a teacher. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mahabha. Yeah, thank you for providing us a context of the Buddhist faith and that. I asked Dr. Nasruddin to give his thought, especially on religious harmony and how uh, religious clergy and the Muslim tradition play a part. Well, thank you. Uh YPS and Dr. Matthew Matthews for kindly inviting us. I'm very fearful of bells and warnings, so I'm going to keep to my text to ensure that I keep to the five minutes. So respected religious leaders and um, ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon. Um, some introductory comments on the, uh, as a Muslim and as a member of the community working together with religious leaders, both from within and beyond the Muslim community, uh, towards a harmonious and cohesive Singaporean society. I think as a Muslim, I believe that the essence of my faith is really to find peace by finding God in everything that we see and do. And a powerful reminder of this is the harmony with which God creates nature um, around us, the universe, the planetary systems, the alternation between day and night. Uh, each element is different, but they exist together in harmony, and each has a different but complementary role. So we are constantly reminded that there are differences all around us, but there is a core that binds us together and the ultimate objective living as a society is to find the harmonious balance that benefits everyone. Without the real effort to achieve harmony, differences can easily turn into conflicts. So as Muslims, we ask God to let us remain steadfast on the path of peaceful and harmonious living at all times and in all conditions. Uh, through a prayer which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us, uh, God is peace and the source of peace. Thus, let us live peacefully and harmoniously. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam fa'ayna rabbana bis salam. And out of this deep spiritual attachment to peace and harmony, Islam makes it as one of the foremost obligations of all Muslims to be fair, just, and kind, uh, and to acknowledge and appreciate the presence of other communities around us, to get to know and work together for the common good. And our respective traditions are also replete with examples of luminaries of inter-religious living and understanding. Those who profoundly understood their respective traditions but engaged others in constructive ways. Uh, within the acrid polemics that characterized much of the Middle Ages, there were some bright sparks. I recall the work of the 13th century Jewish philosopher and scholar in Baghdad, Ibn Kamuna, 
who discussed Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. His work was not free from criticisms nor from um, accusations of biasness, but Ibn Kamuna provided as fair an account as possible of the theologies of each of these religions and defended them where necessary as if he belonged to each of them. And in the modern period, we recall the instrumental work of the Second Vatican Council and the conciliar document Nostra Etate, uh, which sparked efforts globally to enhance interreligious understanding and harmony around the world, such as the trilogue of the Abrahamic faith in the movement in the US. And more recently, in 2007, Muslim and Christian leaders came together under the Common Word Initiative, aiming at rapprochement between the two faiths. So all sounds great and rosy at this point. We should not have much problems. And perhaps there's no, not much need for this forum as well. The reality, however, is a lot more challenging. As religious communities, we each have our own religious heritage and history, whether through certain episodes in our long history or in our classical theologies and rulings, we may find references that, if taken out of context, could easily be used to undermine harmony today. And there have been groups which have insidiously used such references either to justify their acts of violence or to break up societies. Here, religious leaders must be present, be aware of such landmines, and to continue and guide their community on the correct interpretations. And when we look at the religious leadership in Singapore, we can be quite proud of what has been achieved thus far. We respect each other. We have a deep understanding of each other's faith and community. And there's a lot of goodwill between us. Most of us are just a call away for advice or help. Uh, the Harmony Center at Bishan, for example, has been a hub of meaningful interactions and a constant source of friendships for followers of all religions in Singapore. In fact, a lot of the people that we have met in this, uh, this afternoon are people that we have always seen uh, in our events at the Harmony Center. But there is a further opportunity for us, for all of us, to develop this into a lifestyle and culture which we as religious leaders could help nurture in our communities. For the Muslim community, we have implemented the Asatiza Recognition Scheme where all religious teachers need to be registered and abide by the Code of Ethics, which emphasizes the need to respect other faith communities and not to denigrate others, even as we speak of differences. Underpinning this approach is the need to put forth interpretations and practices that are rooted in our social context. We as Muslims are of the firm view that this is part of our religious tradition and learning, and a duty that these and future generations should fulfill as we deal with a more diverse, more open and complex world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nasruddin. <laughs> Providing us a good sense of how Muslims look at religious harmony. Uh, next, Bishop Solomon, your thoughts on the Christian tradition. Well, once again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ma Dr. Matthew Matthews and the team for this invitation. And uh, it's nice to see old friends here. And uh, I'd like to begin by saying that Christians uh, worship and follow the Lord Jesus Christ, who's called the Prince of Peace in the Bible. And uh, it is something that's important to the Christian community as it functions in a multiracial, multireligious society. My task is to actually explain the role of religious leaders, in, especially in terms of uh, helping maintain and build religious harmony. So uh, let me begin by, uh, like Venerable Shi, that I'd like to share with you about the, uh, the common roles of Christian pastors and leaders, as we understand, from biblical teaching and from Christian tradition. Uh, the, uh, the first role, interestingly, is that of a teacher. The, the religious leader or pastor is essentially a religious teacher. That's very important. And I personally believe that that's a very important function. Uh, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament writes to uh, one of his protégés, a younger pastor, Timothy, and he spells out the qualifications of pastors. And it's a pretty long list. But if you look at it, actually it's all about character and reputation. And the only uh, skill or competency that was required was the ability to teach. And I think that underlines the importance of the religious leader as a teacher. Secondly, the religious leader is considered as a, as a shepherd, a pastoral shepherd, a spiritual shepherd, which means, of course, to take care of the needs of the flock, the congregation, 
But it's interesting that there's another dimension to it. Uh, the shepherd is supposed to look out for wolves among the sheep. That means they actually infiltrate or they bring in nasty stuff. They bring in heresy. And so the shepherd is supposed to protect against false teaching, which uh, again is very important because the risen Christ, when he writes to the seven churches in what is today called Turkey in Asia Minor, he addresses many of the churches, and many of the churches have problems with the emergence of false teaching, heresy. So that's the other role of the pastor or religious leader. The third function or role is that of a, of a leader, basically organizing, leading forward, and so on, organizing the community, etc. So I'd like to take that and apply it in the context of religious harmony in Singapore. What's the role of the religious leader in helping religious harmony being built up here in Singapore? So let me begin by saying, first of all, of course, by teaching. Religious leaders need to teach what is truth in their religious community, because if you know the truth, you can spot the untruth. You can spot the fake, so to speak. So I think that is an important function that uh, belongs to religious leaders or pastors. They are supposed to diligently teach the flock what is actually the teaching of the faith. Uh, the second thing is to model. Because as a shepherd, they model. And uh, I remember once, you know, this, uh, this group of people who went to Israel for a trip and they got very excited because they saw sheep and they saw a man and they all came down and started taking pictures and the guide who was uh, leading the group he said why are you so excited because we are seeing the shepherd and the sheep and he said no no that's not the shepherd shepherds always go in front of the sheep uh, this is a butcher he's driving the sheep <laughs> okay so you know you must know the difference so this this idea of modeling because uh, the religious leader is being observed and he sets an example by the way he lives his life, by the way he relates with others, and especially in religious harmony situations, by the way he connects with people of other faith and other religious leaders. So that's modeling. The third aspect is organizing. And here the religious leader or pastor can play an active role in finding ways to enhance uh, communication, relationships, interactions, and so on and so forth. So for instance, in the year 2008, uh, some of us in the NCCS, we decided that one way to help interaction is to organize a sporting event. You know, people are crazy about sporting events, as you will know during this season. And uh, uh, so we decided we, we can meet without all our religious identities. Let's meet in a common activity that we forget our, in a sense, uh, overt religious identity and just have a good time. And so we organized the, the uh, community engagement games, which continues today uh, because every year religious uh, groups organize this and now we call it Harmony Games. So I think something like that, taking initiative, uh, finding new ways to enhance this kind of engagement, I think is another important function of the religious leader. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bishop Solomon. <laughs> now turn to Monsignor Philip Hing to provide us a Roman Catholic response. I'd like to first like to thank Dr. Matthew Matthews for inviting the Catholic Church for this, um, for this event. I would like to begin by saying that Whatever I say is only to represent the Catholic Church and not any other Christian denominations. Um, the context of understanding the Archdiocese of Singapore Catholic Church um, would be helpful if we understand the overall view of how the Catholic Archdiocese belongs to and is inseparable from a larger structure and reality within which it functions. So the religious head 
of the Catholic Church in the Archdiocese of Singapore, as in each diocese in the world, is the bishop. He is the leader of, in religious matters, in moral matters, in providing uh, guidelines, and also he has the final say, so to speak, as far as the Archdiocese is concerned. But inseparable from each diocese is that it belongs to a larger structure of reality, which is the universal Catholic Church that is headed by the Pope in Rome. So the universal Catholic Church is, so to speak, a summation of all dioceses who are in communion with, com of communion with each other in the world, with the Pope as its head. So the Pope being the leader of the universal church not only leads but provides the universal guidance, inspiration of how the universal Catholic Church is to function and live the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you look at the, the, the slide that I have presented here, first you see the Pope Francis says, I can't read, let me just see. It says, let the church always be a place of mercy and hope where everyone is welcome, loved, and forgiven. I think this speaks a lot and sums up everything of what the Catholic Church in its interpretation of the gospel is all about. An inclusiveness that, that respects all peoples, all religion, regardless of race, language, and culture. So here we have the Pope in the first top right corner picture as a gathering of inter-religious leaders in France in April this year. And this is a representative, representative uh, a picture of many other different gatherings and symposiums and con conferences of inter-religious that is organized um, in Rome. The second picture on the right bottom is the picture of what we call the celebration of Holy Thursday during two days before Easter celebration. The ritual, the re religious ritual of the washing of feet of the Last Supper of Jesus of his 12 apostles. Here, he, he washes the feet as a symbol that to be a disciple of Christ, to follow him is to truly to serve for the greater good and salvation of all peoples. The Pope, instead of usually washing the feet of the various people of the, of, of the Catholic people, he chooses to wash the feet of different religious people, migrants, workers, and in that picture, he's washing and kissing the feet of a Muslim migrant refugee. So this, in many ways, highlights the gospel values that we, we profess of not only being inclusive of all peoples, but Christ's preferential love for the poor, the needy, and the marginalized. The, to highlight this, I think one historic event of the Catholic Church that, that must be stated really is Vatican II Council of 1965. The historic event of the Catholic Church where in the history of the Church, it opens the windows and the doors to take in fresh air, to be more inclusive, and to truly en engage in interreligious dialogue among, any other, among many other good things that we have. And the document that, that is part of Vatican II Council was um, Nostra Aetate, uh, that was prom promulgated on the 28th of October 1965. And in 1986, Pope John Paul II gathered 160 inter-religious leaders of the world in Assisi to celebrate World Day of Peace by gathering all these inter-religious leaders for prayer and fasting. Then in 2015, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Nostra Aetate, historical, historical uh, document. And on 2016, we have Pope Francis again calling inter-religious leaders to Assisi for that celebration of inter-religious harmony and peace. So we see that Archbishop William Goh takes its cue, inspiration and guideline from Pope Francis as our leader of the Universal Church. 
And all that is happening in the Archdiocese flows from that universal unity and inspiration of the Pope and, and the bishops in Rome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monsignor. We have Ramesh to provide a Hindu perspective on the issues. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Um, good afternoon, distinguished guests. Several of my gurus here also here in the audience. Thank you for this opportunity to take part in this forum. Well, definitely this uh, subject about the maintenance of the Religious Harmony Act and Racial Harmony brings back fond memories uh, for me, especially when I was involved in news reporting, reported the white paper. I, in fact, I also made a written submission to the Select Committee on my personal basis, and uh, of course later to cover the debate in Parliament of the Act. So it's nice to come back here and talk about this subject several years ago, several years later. Now, what is the role of religious leaders, particularly in the Hindu community, in upholding racial and religious harmony in Singapore? These are two aspects which we often hear as important bedrocks for the stability of Singapore, something which our late Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew has been drumming into all of us ever since Singapore became independent. On the part of the Hindu community, first, we will continue to work closely with all races and religions in Singapore to ensure that no one tries to create cracks and ruptures in our society and attempt to sow discord amongst anyone here. I think the interracial harmony circles, the interracial confidence circles, all these have really come a long way ever since uh, they were set up post 9-11 in Singapore to build that close rapport. We have, even today, we have many uh, grassroots bodies, um, other activist groups visiting our temples, wanting to know more about the Hindu religion, our practices, more about the gods, why do we break a, a coconut for Lord Ganesha. So these are things which will continue within the Hindu community. We welcome all races and religions to visit our temples to learn more about our practices, to learn more about what is uh, Deepavali. Deepavali is not our New Year. Deepavali is the Festival of Lights. The Hindus celebrate New Year in April, on the 14th of April. So there's a difference between Deepavali and the Tamil New Year. So do come and visit us. We welcome you to our institutions, to our temples, to learn more. And we'll be very happy to share with you more about the Hindu religion so that you are well informed about what are the Hindu practices that the community embraces. But of course, we have social media. It's rife with many critical and often distorted stories about practices and teachings of various faiths. So I think as faith leaders, what we should do is to build a platform amongst all of us so that we can reach out to each and every one of us representing the different faiths. We can cross-check the facts, cross-check whatever information or misinformation that has been posted online on social media before we give our responses so that our responses are a collective response and the correct response. Now next, we must also look into developing a common strategy to oppose these attempts that, you know, they try to demean our faith and its followers. And I think that, is, that cuts across the board all our races and religions, not just Hinduism. So I think that's one area we can continue to build and work on. Now, speaking on the part of the Hindu Advisory Board, whose primary role is to advise the government on all matters concerning Hinduism, we will continue to keep a very close watch and check on all the visiting speakers and preachers of the Hindu faith who come into Singapore to give lectures and discourses. Of course, there is a normal screening process. We check on all of them before we give our stamp of approval. So far, so good. No problematic cases. Our visiting speakers, most of them are quite regular ones. They know the ground rules here in Singapore. They know where they have to stop, what are the limits. And so far, we have not had any problems when they deliver their discourses. So we welcome them. My third point is an internal point. We as the Hindu community, we have to keep our own house in order, namely our religious organizations and institutions, the way we run them, the way we run our temples, 
and the way we administer them so that most important point is everyone who comes to visit our temples, our organizations, who seeks services and assistance, everyone is treated equally when they come to offer their prayers and services. This is a very delicate area in our temples especially because of the influx of foreign talent. You know, we have a lot of devotees who come to our temples, both local and foreign talent. And that's something we have told our religious leaders that they have to keep a close watch. No discrimination, no favoritism, and make sure that everyone is treated equally so that everybody contributes to building a happy, harmonious, and a racially charged and happy Singapore for all of us to live in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ramesh. We've just heard a number of perspectives uh, from the main religious traditions in Singapore, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, a good sense of the role of religious leaders. I think we've heard some of the roles in terms of not just ritual performance, but also in terms of teaching and modeling to uh, the adherents, the matters of faith, and also how to live out faith in uh, the day-to-day -day life. Uh, we also heard about uh, the role that religious uh, teachers have in terms of building an inclusive space in Singapore. I think we have heard different kind of examples and what goes on. If I can just have the panel to just reflect on a few things, uh, and I think especially uh, sitting back here, and, and obviously uh, for many of you having very senior positions either now or previously in uh, your religious tradition, a community, uh, and, and now looking at, at some of the issues today, uh, what, would you see would, what, what would you say would be some of the main uh, tension points uh, towards building that kind of religiously harmonious space in Singapore. Uh, do you see any tensions? Maybe there aren't, but I'm just wondering whether you, you do see some, and uh, if you see some, uh, are there uh, ways we can do better or address some of these threats to our stability? I hate to go, go one by one, and uh, I just encourage anyone to throw it. Thanks, Ramesh. I think I'll basically build up, build on my point about the need for you know. I mean, if I speak from the from the from the temple perspective, um, I think it's important that you know whoever comes to offer their services and prayers are are treated equally. That's very important. We, I mean, that's a that's a that could be a tension, a point of tension, uh, especially with the influx of foreign talent, you know, from India, Sri Lanka, and and, and Hindus being very strong, you know patronizers of, of temples. Uh, the way we administer our services in our temples has to be equal across the board. You can't show favoritism you know, to one group of people and, you know, and look down on another group of people. I mean, that is, is no go when it comes to, uh, to, uh, to, to temples and religious organizations. And second area, of course, is, is, is misinformation, you know, um, carrying wrong information about festivals and how it is conducted or, or practices and how these are conducted. That's where uh, the, the point about you know, cross-checking, if someone else heard, hears something about a particular religion or, or, or practice, you know, before putting it up on, on social media and Facebook and ridiculing such practices without even checking. You know, and, you know, these are the kinds of things which we really need to uh, watch closely and monitor closely to make sure that you know, we maintain that strong bond and harmony amongst our races and religions. Thank you, Ramesh. Uh, any other thoughts? So, is any? Um, I think the real challenge nowadays is how to appreciate all other religions. For myself, uh, I'm actually a fan of the Archdiocese of Singapore. They have their Catholic Life. <laughs> they have their Catholic Life uh, channel on YouTube, I think. And uh, I, was I was just online and I was watching the whole of your Good Friday festivities and the rituals going on. And I really like uh, the Catholic Church in, in that sense. So I think moving forward, it's, it's about how we, we can engage our own followers to appreciate the other religions as not only um, a religion, probably as also a, um, a way of living, um, an art, um, you know, a different way of expression, but uh, similarly um, for, for, for the good of the human, for, of humankind. 
And uh, secondly, I think I will also think that uh, a, a big challenge to especially the Buddhist faith is um, uh, how do we control the foreign uh, religious leaders from coming in? Um, not uh, not men. Uh, I mean, a lot of them would um, have uh, alternative views, and some of them would be um, pretty deviant from orthodox uh, Buddhist um, texts. So that's another challenge which we are trying to resolve with uh, the government, especially. We have speakers coming in and um, they are being hosted by companies, uh, not by temples, by companies or by individuals. Um, this will fall uh, out of um, the Buddhist Federation's uh, control as uh, yeah. So we cannot uh, ask, for example, the Ministry of Manpower to, to cut their permits. We cannot ask police to cut their permit. So that's, that's the challenge which we are facing right now. Yeah. Just a, a small uh, addition to what was mentioned earlier about misinformation and as well as untruth. And also the, your introductory presentation on the um, degree of diversity. And I think the... Um, we are increasingly witnessing you know, the, 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 the deepening of diversity in our society. Um, but the increase in diversity is not um, supported by an increase in interreligious literacy. And that could lead to uh, a lot of misinformation and untruths, which people may not be very sure. And that could um, shape in a negative way the perceptions of communities towards other religious groups. Um, and also, within, even within certain communities, I think there are a lot more voices. Um, the access to information, especially with uh, mentioning again earlier about social media, um, online, and um, some of these voices are quite confident and assertive, and there is also that possibility of challenging a certain authority on the, or the representation of a religious faith, and that, that leads to some kind of confusion within a community. How do you respond to this? Um, so, for example, if you think that it's important for us in the spirit of preserving harmony, that we should keep in check certain ideas which are not suited to our context. You often find that there would be um, you know, uh, rebuttals to this or there could be objections to this. And I think one of the challenges for religious leaders is to really come up with credible and authoritative explanations that could convince your community that this is the way forward given the context of our society. And I think that's an area that we have to continue to work on. For me, the, probably the area of tension for religious harmony could be seen as... First, the context of Singapore, we are very blessed to see that the large majority of, of the citizens and everyone in the country are in, truly supportive and value the peace and the harmony that, that is experienced and enjoyed in this country. But as for the tension, I, I would tend to think that it is not so much on the external front that we need to, to address, but more it is, seems to be dormant and below the surface uh, of individuals who are particularly vulnerable to the extremist views and ideologies that are being promoted, of distorted views of religion, uh, etc. These people who are, are people who are suffering and experiencing a lot of pain and, and rejection and marginalization um, in their lives. Whether personally or by family or whatever situation they are going through, they feel rejected by society, uh, by people, by their friends. And so when they experience uh, confusion in their lives, darkness and miseries, they feel rejected, they become suicidal and disillusioned about life and the world. The tendency for them is to be vulnerable to become lone wolves or to be uh, easily con convinced to join extreme ideologies. So uh, for them, I suppose because they have been suffering so much in their life, they, they rather join extremist uh, groups uh, because they have nothing to lose. And they, in joining these extremists, they probably dream and fantasize of a better world where, where where they can be respected and accepted. So, I think um, we, we should, in response, uh, never turn away such people who are troubled, always treat them 
uh, with great respect, affirm their human dignity and rights, and, and relate to them with great compassion. And as uh, Christians, we, we, we are to look upon them as truly brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think if, if we can each uh, relate to people with respect, regardless of their race and also social status, especially the poor who come knocking on our doors on our church with respect, then it will go a, a long way in society. I think the obvious uh, challenge that can be associated with the word threat, threat to social harmony or religious harmony in Singapore is terrorism. Uh, that's an ever-present reality. And uh, I think the authorities have, are taking and have taken uh, necessary steps to minimize whatever dangers that exist. And of course, religious communities also have to do their part. If something like that unfortunate happens, uh, how are we going to respond to that kind of situation? And I think, thankfully, the, the social fabric of Singapore over time has been carefully nurtured uh, to where we are today. The, the danger for us is it's not quite so rosy outside. And then when it's imported in, whether it's uh, religious violence or uh, ideologies that are actually uh, not quite... Uh, true to the religious faiths, then these can easily come in. And you know, it, the access is very easy. You can stop preachers from coming to Singapore, but you can't, you can't stop them from sending messages on YouTubes and, and other means. So WhatsApp, one of my difficulties as a religious leader is staying away from WhatsApp groups. There are too many. And I've consciously said to people who want me in, I said, no, no, if you are sending messages to and fro, if I'm in the group, if there's something wrong said, I got to intervene. If I don't intervene, you all get carried away thinking that it's all right. So if you hear anything suspicious, let me know, and I'll try to address it in my teaching or writing or something like that. So that's a, there's a lot going on like that. Uh, we can shut the doors, but the windows are open. So. Uh, literally, windows are open, so uh, you know the internet is, uh, is it has steady access to to our people here. The other issue, I think, uh, I think hinted by Mr. Ramesh, is that uh, over time, especially recent days, we have a lot of influx of people who have not been part of Singapore community or society. I remember in my school days. We were actually colorblind. We, our best friends were people of other faiths and other groups. My good friend Alami is smiling. You know, we've been lifelong friends. And we, it just came naturally. That, that's how we lived our days when uh, special occasions, religious festivals came. People exchanged. They brought their cookies to you know, their neighbors, and it was reciprocated. But in more recent days, besides, of course, all the social stratification and, and so on and so forth that's taking place, new people have come in. We can't blame them because they don't have that culture or tradition. So they come into our mosques or churches or temples, uh, and then they, they have to be actually uh, introduced into the Singapore way of life, the Singapore way of thinking and doing. And if we don't, uh, we may be importing you know, biases, uh, that sort of thing. So I think that's a challenge for us in society. And uh, the, the, the third point I want to mention, I'm not sure I'm counting actually, but, <laughs> but the, the third point is this, that uh, while we are talking about uh, interreligious uh, harmony, uh, one of the things that maybe is not often mentioned is the place of secularism. Secularism, uh, there are 20% of Singaporeans who, are, who have no religion, so to speak, one in five. And uh, secularism is, is quite a spectrum. And a lot of secularism that comes into Singapore is actually Western secularism, Western liberalism and so on. Now, they have different views about religion. They don't have so many qualms about making fun of religious leaders or uh, deities or religious communities. They make films, they crack jokes, it's on TV and so on. Now, if we import that into Singapore, we're going to have problems. And I think this is something that perhaps we need to also uh, think about. 
It's not just relationship between religious communities, but also how religious communities relate with the secular, uh, secularists. Uh, and I think that will be an increasingly uh, important uh, factor that we need to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I think we've, had, we've heard some very important ideas when it comes to maintaining or some of the threats which we now face in terms of religious harmony. I think the thing that was quite common, which I heard quite a bit, was the whole idea about uh, we have to watch the fact that there are influences which are outside Singapore which have a I mean, different societies have different makeup, different way of doing things and uh, different kind of ideologies, different kinds of premises. Religion as practice in Singapore might differ. I mean the same uh, Buddhism might be a little different in practice somewhere else, different kind of context and different kind of teaching that comes out from there. Uh, just thinking about reflecting about one of the areas which we have been thinking a little bit more in more recent years, I've mentioned that uh, in my opening presentation, uh, the idea about uh, the sense of strong exclusivism, uh, my faith and what I believe in and therefore uh, that's pure, that's special, that gives me a sense of identity and everybody else is different and uh, maybe uh, and I, I either kind of self-exclude myself or I do things which kind of exclude others from being a part of what I have. I think we've seen it in different ways in different societies. I'm just wondering how that works out in Singapore, whether there are concerns about that in different religious groups and uh, anything is being done to deal with that. Can I begin? Sure, with, uh, you can start. I, I thought I, I, I'll just uh, start it off by talking about definitions. Because when we use words, we may actually mean different things. And so when you have the word exclusive or inclusive or pluralism, uh, I, I like to share that for the last few centuries in Christian thought, in Christian uh, theological circles, there, these words are actually carefully defined. Uh, and it, they represent a certain way of looking at reality. So the problem that we have as Christians is when uh, the narrative says exclusive is bad, inclusive is good, and pluralism is our future. Because all these words mean very specific things for, for Christians, for the Christian community. So let me explain. Exclusivism is actually a theological position uh, that pertains to doctrinal exclusivism. I mean, last year we celebrated our, uh, the Reformation, which took place 500 years ago. And if you look at the key slogans of the Reformation, it's all about doctrinal exclusiveness. Now, this is the challenge. Doctrinal exclusiveness does not mean social exclusiveness. And in fact, in Christian teaching, while we stand for doctrinal exclusiveness. Otherwise, we are un unfaithful to our faith community and beliefs. But we also taught in Scripture to be socially inclusive, to love your neighbor as yourself. Love your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. So this nuanced relationship between doctrinal conviction and social inclusiveness, reaching out in friendship with compassion, uh, to serve others in society. I think this is uh, a position we are very comfortable with. It is something that we stand for. So I suspect then that when people use exclusive and inclusive, they're actually talking about social exclusiveness and social inclusiveness. But because it's not defined, uh, it is then uh, sometimes misunderstood, I think, in Christian circles that, uh, you know, this may cause misunderstanding. So all I'm calling for is let's be on the same page. When we use words, let's try to define. If you're talking about social exclusiveness, sure, we agree with that, that we shouldn't uh, be like that. We should be socially inclusive. And let's not, you know, uh, go into discussions about uh, doctrinal exclusiveness, that's a matter of doctrine and liturgy and so on. But we are more interested in creating social harmony and, and being uh, friends across religious communities, and that's important. Pluralism is the same. Uh, one of our very good theologians, Leslie Newbegin, a missiologist, said there's a difference between plural uh, and pluralism. A plural is a sociological description Pluralism is a philosophy, 
a theological philosophy. That's right. So I think when words like this are used quite freely without uh, clear definition, they can cause misunderstanding. So all I'm saying is let's be clear about definitions, and then I think it will deepen our engagement and dialogue. Thanks, Bishop. Yeah. So we're going to talk about social exclusion here, right? So not so much exclusivist beliefs unless you've got a take on that, and whether that but that has some kind of link with social exclusion, or you don't see that. Nazarita, you want to say something? Just following up on the um, social exclusivism, let's be very clear about it. We're talking about social uh, inclusiveness and exclusiveness. Um, I think the, one of the um, immediate sort of difference that we find is that the, the context of societies can be very different. Um, when we look at Islam and the fact that there are many Muslims and Muslim scholars and preachers that come from, say, majority Muslim countries, um, the social reality is quite different, very stark from ours. And, um, you know, when you walk in the streets, uh, there's a very low chance of you meeting a non-Muslim if you live in a majority Muslim country, as opposed to, say, in Singapore. Uh, even in our mosque, in our institutions, um, even like the uh, past Ramadan, we even had our breakfast with non-Muslim friends and neighbours. So that is a very different sort of reality. Um, and for that reason, I think it's important to recognise um, that these will, of course, have implications on the way we interpret religious text in terms of putting the priorities right for the community. Um, so a, a simple, uncritical importation of ideas from, you know, foreign, uh, you know, from, from abroad or from other preachers who may not be very familiar with the context, I think, might uh, spell danger for, for our society. And I think the, uh, recently we had the Grand Imam of al who visited Singapore um, he carried exactly the same message, although he's an Egyptian. Um, uh, he preaches a lot and gives guidance to the Sunni world, but very much the majority Muslim world. But he acknowledges and recognizes that you know, Singapore is a very different uh, society in so far as how diverse we are. And these will affect the way we understand and interpret religious teachings. So in that sense, um, there is no doubt whatsoever that as a Muslim, you should be socially inclusive. But there is a problem of definition from another angle, which is the, the extent or the limits of, if you like, um, what, what constitutes social inclusiveness or social exclusiveness. Um, so this might be something that we ought to have further discussions on. Uh, when we interact with people, um, you know, certain um, uh, interactions and the norms in society might be interpreted differently. So what I may see is, um, an acceptable practice as a Muslim might not be seen as acceptable within the larger society. Um, so that conversation needs to be, to be had in order for us to understand uh, what is okay and what is not okay so that we do not misinterpret the, the action of, of, of the person that we want to interact with because that will have a certain repercussions on whether we think um, an individual or a society might be inclusive or exclusive. I'm sure that as a, as a society as a whole, we will have a certain broad understanding of what these behaviours are, what are inclusive behaviours. Uh, we should, if there is a consensus in one community, I think we should encourage that behaviour very, very much. Those that we are not very clear about, I think we should have those conversations. And um, of course, ideally, we want to have a certain uh, common understanding between all um, segments of society that, you know, this is the kind of um, behaviours that we ought to encourage. All right. Anybody else? If not, thank you. We've heard a lot from the panel, and I think it's a good opportunity at least to move towards everybody else here who might have some thoughts about the issue. If we're dealing with the subject about the role of religious leadership in terms of the building and the maintenance of religious harmony in Singapore, and uh, I'll be happy if you have some questions you'd like to raise it for the uh, panel here to give their thoughts on and some comments that you might have. And uh, if you'd like to do that, I uh, just want you to get to the mic there and uh, just introduce yourself. It would be nice if you can tell us your name and also uh, your background, where you are, your affiliation, if it's possible. And then I think we'll... But of course, keep your comments short so that we can have a lot of dialogue. I think it's working. Just go ahead and speak. It's working. Just go ahead oh, and okay. speak. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Um, 
So my name is Orlando Woods. I'm representing Singapore Management University here. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Matthews and IPS, for uh, inviting our small SMU delegation to come and join you for this uh, fantastic session on uh, religious harmony in Singapore. Um, I had one question, which is actually building off uh, Dr. Nasser's final point about social inclusion. And it's very simply, to what extent do you see this idea of social exclusion within your faith communities, within your Muslim or Christian or Buddhist faith communities. I'm assuming that you would answer not as much as you would like it to be. Um, then that tells me that there's a mismatch between the teachings and between the actual application of those teachings in day-to-day -day life. So I guess my question following on from that is, what are you doing as the religious leaders of your respective faith traditions to try and close that gap, to try and minimize it? I understand that teaching is a large part of it, but how do you actually get your followers and your communities to follow those teachings? Thank you, Orlando. And uh, I think while the panel is thinking, I wonder if some other people have questions so that we can group a few questions together and we can, thank you, sir, you can. Anybody else, you can take the other mic. I'll take one more question. We'll have three questions and then we'll have some discussion. Thank you. It's on. I think you just go ahead and speak. Is it Vox? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. It is a very wonderful experience for me to be here to listen to what you are uh, saying about the religious harmony and the religious pluralism in, in Singaporean societies. I am uh, coming from South Korea. I'm attending this international, uh, East Asian scientific study of religion, uh, which is now being held in the SMU. Um, so when the first uh, moderator, you, Dr. Matthew, uh, giving us some introductory knowledge about some what's going on in the Singaporean uh, societies, you said that uh, Singaporean government certainly banned to religious person so entry into the Singapore societies because they um, mentioned there was some behaved some uh, unideally. Um, so my question is that, um, do you think that the um, government's um, intervention into the, your religious, uh, the culture of religious harmony and the uh, culture of religious pluralism is uh, ideal or is necessary? My point, point of view is that the, you know, I think the government let them be uh, there and, and in terms of their own politics of recognition. That's my question. Thank you very much. And uh, the third question here. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Travis. I'm a year two student at NUS. All right, first up, thank you very much for sharing. Uh, one of the things we've probably learned about from this sharing earlier on is about how the importance of religious leaders in teaching and modeling for people to follow, all right, in building that um, community. Our government has always told us um, it's not a question of when, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when a terror attack will happen. So my question is, assuming there is a terror attack tomorrow at, say, Changi Airport, done by a religious group, right, are our religious leaders ready and able to rebuild that fabric of society that could have possibly been torn? If yes, how? If no, are steps being taken to help us rebuild, potentially rebuild, in the event of such an attack. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have three questions here, and I think our panel's thinking hard about them, but uh, if I can just quickly kind of uh, remind them. Just, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll take the other sure. set. So thank you. We'll get you for the next set. But uh, first one about whether social exclusion is, or social, the amount of social inclusion we have in our, our religious organizations, are they ideal in what's going on there, uh, to this idea about whether, I think we have a panel later on to deal with the role of the state, and uh, we'll deal more with that, but uh, we've heard just now about some of your thoughts about uh, banning foreign preachers, because I think religious communities too have some ideas about this, so I think it would be interesting to take that question, and third, of course, this whole idea about after a terror attack, for instance, if it's religiously motivated, is there some kind of, I mean, system by which religious leaders can play a part in that? Bishop, you want to go first? Very quick answers then. Um, 
whether we are already there in an ideal situation of social inclusiveness, I, 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 I think uh, the answer is no, uh, because more can be done. Uh, we, we, there, are, there are sectors in our society that are not reached out to. I mean, think of the poor, for example. Uh, we need a larger awareness of the, the poor and their struggles and how to actually reach out to them. And there are many other sectors. So, yes, we need to do much more in that area. Whether we are ready for uh, a terrorist attack, I don't think any of us can be perfectly ready, you know, and say, come make my day, you know. Uh, we are not ready. Uh, we are ready, but we can still improve. And I don't think any of our communities has got exact, uh, you know, prototypes of uh, responses and so on. Uh, we already have some frameworks, but we, we have to learn from experience, and I pray to God that it will not happen uh, in, in our society, because we are a very small country. If it happens, it will be quite disruptive. And uh, so I think in that, we can all pray. Uh, <laughs> we can all pray together uh, in that. Um, regarding the question about uh, whether the authorities, the government should intervene in regulating uh, the inflow of speakers who are invited or who come around. Uh, my take on that is that uh, we do not have the framework, as already indicated by uh, 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 Brother Shi, that uh, the Buddhist Federation has no full control over who comes in. And I think the same applies to NCCS. Uh, we have our membership, uh, local member churches, but we do not have full control over who's coming in. I don't know about the other faith communities, but uh, because of that, I think it has to be a cooperative attempt, both by government and religious communities. If it is perceived as purely government, I think that is also not helpful, because there's a state and church uh, you know, separation, so to speak. So here is where perhaps uh, the state and the religious communities can work together so that if there is a problem uh, preacher, consult the religious leadership and have their agreement. And I think it is a much stronger message that these people are kept out, not only by the authorities, but also by the faith communities. So it's a matter of, I think, working together, cooperation. Um, for the Catholic Church, I, I believe there's a very strong, as you know, is the Catholic Church is very hierarchical, where the leader truly is the Archbishop. So we have a structure of communication that is, I would say, pretty strong. And uh, priests and religious organizations are very clear that whoever foreign speakers they wish to bring in, more so, uh, in particular, if the topic is somehow connected to religion, then the sensitivity has to be respected. It has to get clearance from also within the church. Uh, the speaker must be recognized, and also we have to make sure that the speaker has not been holding or preaching extreme views even in a foreign country. That if that is the case, then we would not allow the person to come in. And even if we were to give approval, we will insist that the person's um, uh, text or whatever he wants to present has to comply with the with, um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs that, text had get, that he, the person has to be approved um, before he comes in to give the, the speech. Whereas if a person is purely coming in for religious purposes to celebrate the Eucharist, um, then you will still have to get clearance from our chancery office um, that, that, that he is he's accept, allowed to participate in the community uh, for the religious service. Yeah. So we have that in place. Yeah. And also, just to add, sorry, the Ministry of Law, Shanmugam, has made it also very clearly when he spoke to us religious leaders that while the government may have certain procedures in place to check on foreign speakers, the primary responsibility is on religious leader to screen out the 
the, relig the speakers before we even um, allow the person to process their application with the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you. Ramesh, a quick one on a point by our friend from NUS about whether we are ready for to respond to a terrorist attack. I mean, it's, that's always work in progress. But um, I can assure you that uh, on the part of the Hindu community, we even have an SG secure program for our temples. We have uh, briefed all our temple staff on what they need to do. You know, and, uh, there is a pamphlet, a booklet, which has been translated in Tamil also for them to understand the various procedures, who they need to contact, what needs to be done if something does happen. So you can rest assured that uh, even our foreign staff who man our temples have been thoroughly briefed on what to do in the event of, uh, of, of an attack or, or something untoward happens in the religious institution. Um, as to whether the government should be intervening and interfering in the religious affairs, I think it is good to have some, some control. Uh, I mean, on the part of the Hindu Advisory Board, you know, it's good that there is a screening and a process you know, for religious speakers. Of course, sometimes you know, some of them still do come in on social visit pass, they give a talk and, and, and they go off. You know? I mean, we can't be, it's a bit difficult to you know, have a watch on everyone who comes in and, and gives speeches. But on the whole, so far so good, as I mentioned in my opening address, we have not had any problems so far, and we will, keep to, and we will continue to keep a very close watch on, on, on who comes in and what they say. Thank you. Yeah, just some quick responses to all three points. The uh, first point on social inclusion, I wanted to say that the, there are two things that usually unite people a lot faster than other things. One is food, the other is sports. Right? So we are quite thankful in Singapore, the common spaces in, in these two are not too bad, especially food. I mean, dining, hawker centres, I think we, we do see communities, families coming together regardless of faith and, and race. Um, that's a very, very um, effective, very useful, a uh, very powerful place for us to be socially inclusive. And also sports in terms of you know, um, exercise and activities. I, every Sunday um, at the park uh, in front of my block, they have a Zumba class in the open. Um, the, my only complaint is because it wakes me up. They have a very loud music, so 8.30 to 9.30. But otherwise, whatever I see is something. I mean, I'm not, not <laughs> to see people exercise, but you can observe different uh, families from different backgrounds come together and exercise together and I think that is a very powerful sort of visual that you may not necessarily uh, readily get in, in other societies. So I think we have done quite well. But for religious leaders, I think it's important to counter external influences with, when these influences, external influences are not contextual, they're not helpful to our context. Um, we should also try to encourage more social inclusive behaviours um, and also explain religious positions where necessary because some people really wonder whether is it, is it okay for you to, as a Muslim, um, to, to do certain things and you should come forward and explain that. On government intervention, I think to some extent we must, as a religious community, own our religious discourse. Um, in as much as we want to be inclusive and invite foreign speakers, but I think we have to own it as a community. So where we feel that you know, there are elements or ideas or ideologies of certain speakers which are not constructive, I think it's our duty to sort of express these views and, and help um, curb some of this from, from really influencing our, our community. And certainly in terms of the terrorist attack, I mean, um, Travis, was it? Yeah, you mentioned, I think something that really captured my mind was you said, an act performed by a religious group. And I think that is key. If we allow that kind of perception to set in that you know, a certain terrorist act was done and we say that a religious community committed it, so we let that stereotype set in, and that's where it really will destroy the fabric of society. Uh, the recent Surabaya incident, um, the community in Surabaya refused to even bury their family because they said that what, they, what they've done, uh, the, this, uh, the, the um, uh, suicidal attack, does not represent the Muslim faith. So they refused to accept these people as part of the community, and I think that's an important message. Um, for all sorts of reasons, they might commit something in the name of a certain religion. I think our duty as religious leaders is to make sure that the, um, we do not let these stereotypes set in. And if we try to expand the social experience and relationship of our flock, so in other words, every one of us has a non-Muslim friend or as Muslims or Muslims uh, or non-Muslims has Muslim friends, that will temper your perception of the faith 
and it's, it's quite difficult for you to hold that stereotype and therefore affect the way you look and perceive other communities. And I think that would be very, very helpful and more meaningful as a way to deal with the threat. Thank you. Did you have a Yeah, just a quick one. Um, just spinning off of mine, uh, basically in Singapore, everything is imported, so our religion. So none of our religions actually, you know, just come from somewhere in Singapore. So if we are able to, to move along and be so harmonious now, I'm sure we can continue the good work. Yeah. And uh, secondly, uh, to Travis as well, um, uh, we, we all have this common understanding that uh, religious leaders um, are all peace loving. Yeah. And uh, more often than not, the groups that does things in Singapore are not religious. They, they put on a religious front, but they are not religious. So this is one point we have to educate our followers or devotees. Yeah, so that's just, this is just one. And um, for example, we just had uh, an encounter with an LBGT group. That's another big thing going on. So yeah, so um, for, from, from a Buddhist perspective, we are, we are all inclusive. Um, Buddha aims to throw away the Indian caste system like yeah. so we, we are all inclusive so we have followers who, who have interracial marriages we have foreigners who, who are not not Buddhists but engage Buddhist practices like meditation yeah or prayers even so um, from the Buddhist point of view we, we are pretty much chill with everybody doing yeah, their own things yeah as you know see and uh, yeah but the, the point now is how do we not uh, cross our bottom line? So that, I think, is the role of the government. The government is just to provide a common space, a clean common space, a good foundation for all of, for all of us religious leaders to do our own work and not to you know, intervene or go against another, another, another religion. Um, for, for Buddhists, we... we we do not have uh, Almighty God, but that doesn't mean we do not recognize the Almighty God. See, so that's that's something which, which uh, I always tell our followers. See, but this but this doesn't mean we do not believe in in gods. Yeah, but that doesn't mean there is no God. So I think that's a bring 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 home point uh, to all of us here as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go to my third round of questions. So there are just and there are a few questions, and if you can just get to your mics, and uh, we'll take another three questions, and we'll begin. And uh, maybe if you can get to a mic there after this, uh, uh, gentlemen. Do you want to go ahead, sir, first, and start, and then we'll take okay. those three. Questions. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Saif. I'm from the Civil Service College. Uh, especially since September 11, we've always been exposed and, in fact, inundated. Um, with what makes, for example, a fundamentalist Muslim, uh, extremist Muslim, etc. And it is interesting in this particular panel that we are talking about the role of religious leaders. My question is sort of a mental exercise of sorts. Perhaps it could be provocative, but from the perspective of our faith-based leaders in this distinguished panel, what do you think would make for an extremist Hindu, for example, an extremist Catholic, an extremist Christian, an extremist Buddhist, uh, in the context of Singapore. Because perhaps that's the other side of the coin in trying to address you know, uh, this deluge, this inundation of stereotypes or cliches or misperceptions. And therefore, perhaps the question to us is how then do we see the other side of the coin, or how do other perspectives play into this? Thank you. Thank you. So, um, good afternoon. Thank you for a fascinating panel. My name is Karsten Valla, and I'm coming from the United States, uh, Loyola University, Maryland. And I'm a political scientist, so I'm fascinated by the role of the state and the role of religious leaders. Um, I want to ask a question about religious change because um, one aspect of the question is that if your faith tradition 
uh, has a key aspect, which is that you are to proselytize, you are to evangelize, then what is the, the boundary or the limit? I can see that in some contexts that could be taken as being um, an insult if you're particularly persistent. Um, so I, I just wanted to get a sense from religious leaders. And I think about this in the context you mentioned, Bishop, the, uh, the Reformation 500 years ago. And so I think if you were living in France 500 years ago, the church might have said, we don't want outside ideas coming from Germany, from Martin Luther, to infect our religious harmony in France at the time. Um, and so I think part of religion is a natural change. Um, but if you are someone, a Singaporean, and you are a follower of Iguan Dao or Taoism or something that doesn't exist yet in Singapore, um, how, does, how does someone, how do you balance the freedom of conscience with the, this, what I hear many of you saying is protecting our Singapore from outside ideas? Um, because the history of the Protestant church is the history of continual innovation and splitting. Um, and if you're in a recognized religious group, you're in a very powerful position now because you have a community. So part of the question is about religious change. Um, part of the question is actually sociological. I don't know, Dr. Matthews, if you know what are, how the statistics of religious populations are changing in Singapore. Because in some countries, uh, such as Lebanon, they don't want to do a census because the Christian population has decreased so much, the Muslim population has increased, and therefore they want to keep the status quo. Um, so it's more of a comment and, and any responses. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Christian. Yeah. Hello, good afternoon, distinguished panel of speakers and uh, fellow participants in this forum. My question is very simple. Um, we all recognize the importance of religious and uh, racial harmony here in Singapore and that we're all trying as religious leaders uh, to educate and to teach uh, our followers, your followers, to recognize the importance uh, of this uh, maintaining and sustaining this religious harmony. But uh, may I just ask a uh, ballpark figure, exactly what percentage perhaps of your followers are actually interested and are uh, are keen on engaging in interreligious dialogue? Or, uh, in other words, uh, does interreligious harmony and dialogue actually feature on the radar of your average follower or devotee in your particular religion? Thank you. Thank you. Got three questions here, and uh, very helpful. I think fairly difficult. First one what would you describe as an extremist of any particular religious tradition? I think this is useful, especially when you think about the fact that. Extremism may be defined broadly. Uh, second one, I think very important, this whole idea about whether proselytization, conversion, is tantamount to destroying religious harmony. And uh, in Singapore, there is substantial religious change over the years, and uh, you can notice in the census figures and conversion. Uh, in fact, our last study, about half of the Christians who were in our study were, were converts. So, I mean, it's very substantial. So, that obviously comes from some religion, and so obviously, uh, questions about harmony there. Uh, and of course, then the, the whole issue about the actual participation in dialogue uh, just kind of is interesting. Ten years ago, uh, my first IPS forum, I presented a paper on uh, Christian clergy and their reluctance of interreligious dialogue. Uh, that was about ten years ago, and I think the media took a lot of uh, spin on that. I think maybe things have changed since then. Uh, all right, so three questions. Who would like to start? Signal. <laughs> well, I suppose with regards to the first question of how would we regard a Catholic to be an extremist, he would be a person who, who doesn't really uh, believe and practice the Christian faith. He would, be an, he would be reject the importance of uh, respecting other religions and other persons. So he would be a person who is absolutely self-absorbed, self-centered, or perhaps for whatever personal reason, um, uh, uh, suffering in pain, as I mentioned earlier, the vulnerables of society that, that feel totally ostracized, rejected, and, and in deep pain. But regardless of a person being an extremist, 
we should never reject any person. As the Pope himself has said, all are forgiven, all should be related to with, with mercy and love. And if a person who truly cannot uphold these basic gospel values of Christ, then, and then he cannot, he's not upholding and living the Catholic faith. Um, with regards to the boundaries of uh, evangelization, the Catholic faith, um, while we believe that truly salvation comes for all peoples come through Jesus Christ, who died for the salvation of all peoples, those who are not baptized Christians, uh, we believe in the baptism of desire. Meaning to say that if a good Muslim or Hindu or, or whatever who does not know enough of the Christian faith, but lives a good life of a Muslim, and, or even without any religion, tries to live a good life, not because he does not want to embrace Christianity, but his upbringing in an exposure and environment does not give him enough knowledge or exposure to the faith, then in his heart of heart, if he had known enough of the faith, of the Christian faith, he would also have been accepted. In that sense, subjectively, he would have what we call received the desire of baptism and in God's mercy and justice and compassion, he can still be saved through Christ and that he is not doomed for life. So we do not see uh, non-Christians as oppositions or non-Christians uh, as uh, people that, that die, die, has to be converted. But we share the faith uh, uh, happily, willingly, with, uh, with passion because we believe that uh, there's much good um, that is offered through the sacraments and the belief and the teachings of the church for a person to live a morally and more wholesome life. And, and all that we teach and profess in the church is actually nation building. So in that sense, uh, we are very inclusive uh, in, in the approach. Well, uh, in terms of how much, the third question of how much do our Catholics know and believe in interreligious harmony. I would say that large, a, a, a large majority would really be aware of the value of the importance of peace, preserving peace, that we should not take anything for granted. We should learn to respect all religions and races. That is, a, that is something which I believe is being upheld by the large, large majority of Catholics. But as to the actual participation of, of interreligious uh, uh, dialogue and into belong to IRCC, uh, that is another matter because I think while we are not, uh, while many are not against it, the priority and the focus of, 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 the, of the Catholic Church is really quite internal. Many are leaving the church. Why? Because of the attractions of the secular world, of, of riches, material riches, comfort, glory, popularity, power, etc., etc., or there are the push and pull factors in the church that we have to own that if we have not been inclusive enough or respectful or compassionate enough, then we, we also have the church too has to take responsibility for our failures. Nevertheless, there is a pull factor uh, of the secular world that distort the meaning of wholesome living, but yet remains very attractive. Yeah. Thank you. I just realized that we just have five more minutes, so <laughs> I'm going to ask our panel just to be succinct in our answers. Thank you. Bishop, you want to say something? Yeah. Sure. Very quickly then. Uh, I've come to an age where it's difficult to answer three questions at one go. <laughs> you can't remember. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, extremism, to me, uh, obvious, anything that espouses violence is out. Because I believe that none of our religions actually uh, teach that. Extremism, uh, that is extremism. But extremism can also be a kind of a social exclusiveness, a kind of huddling together against the world and not engaging in uh, relationships and so on. That is also extremism. Uh, with regard to evangelism, uh, I know the word proselytization has sometimes bad connotations. It gives the idea that you're forcing somebody else to believe what you're believing. But evangelism is a very positive concept. It's merely sharing our faith with others who want to know. 
And I think in the climate of trust and openness, that is possible. And the Bible does say that whoever asks you for the reason of your hope, be ready to share, but do it with uh, respect and gentleness. And I think that's a biblical principle that we use, we use and we teach. Now, with regard to changes, our brother from U.S., the changes that are constantly taking place. Of course, all kinds of ideas come into the religious communities and the balance between uh, individual conscience you mentioned and the collective need uh, is always a challenge. It's always a challenge. There will be people in our religious community who have, let's say, extreme views. Okay, they believe in certain doctrines or they believe that that's the way we should go. Uh, as long as they don't espouse violence, as, they, as long as they don't create division in the faith community or in society, you can live and let live. I mean, you, you bear with them. Uh, we have these kinds of problems even in society, in the wider society. Uh, so we have to balance it, I think. We cannot become so oppressive that we stop all individual beliefs, but we must also make sure that individual beliefs do not lead to uh, uh, harm in the faith community and in general society. Sorry, just, just a quick comment on the um, change in, in foreign, uh, just to provide a quick background. I mean, at least in our experience, the, some foreign speakers do not want change. So what they want is essentially a, a same set of ideas and teachings that are taught regardless of where you are in the world. And that is something that, that in fact, if, if you, if you uh, stop these elements from coming in, um, it does not mean there is no change even locally. I think what, what is happening is we are trying to sort of adapt the teachings of our tradition and religion to the kind of context we are in. That in itself is a process of change, and, and, and I, I would assure you that that process of change can be quite painful as well, because there are people who may not necessarily uh, you know, agree with you or appreciate with you, and they, you need to sort of continue to reach out and engage them on the need for that kind of change. And so the, the reasons for us to to consider whether a certain viewpoint is suitable. I mean, there are two, two, basically two, two basic considerations. One is the theological basis of their views. Uh, sometimes you find that even foreign speakers, regardless of the credentials, uh, could be quite dodgy or shaky in, in that regard. And secondly, the contextual, contextual appropriateness of, of their ideas. So in that sense, I think, although you may not allow these elements to come in, it does not mean that there is no change even locally. Um, on, a, on what is the definition of an extremist Hindu, I suppose I support the, the point that someone who goes around professing violence, that's one, and secondly, someone who uh, goes around spreading misinformation about religion and religious practices, probably one way to solve this is to win the person over, to you know, get him on our side, and with public education, you know, that, that probably can be, can be settled. Uh, on the second point about uh, proselytizing and evangelizing, I think at the end of the day, um, we go by the same principle, live all, love all, live and let live. As the Hindus always say at the end of their, of their prayers, we say this in Sanskrit, Loga Samasta Sugino Bhavandu, which means love all, embrace all, and let's all live together and live happily. Thank you. Last, last one. <laughs> okay. Um, I also support the Archbishop's uh, view on extreme Buddhists. Um, mainly, if it's uh, extreme Buddhist, normally it would not be a monastic, it would be a lay person. Yeah? And uh, uh, with, with regards to religious change, uh, Buddhists have a very laissez-faire <laughs> attitude towards evangelization. <laughs> so we thought uh, the main teaching is about conditions arising. When conditions are ripe, uh, and we live our role as a good Buddhist, people will be attracted to Buddhism. Uh, if we are all peaceful, all loving, we will be good friends with everybody else. Yep. So uh, uh, at the end of our Buddhist prayers, we also have the same dedication. We may all uh, live together peacefully and we all enjoy the, the, the blessed the bless, blessing of Buddha. And, uh, um, yeah, and, and another point on the, you know, this Taoist and Iguan Tao, yeah, that's another topic altogether because that will be amalgamation of uh, three different faiths all in one. So that's not in the Buddhist context. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I'm sure you would say that this is a very enlightened, each one of our panelists have enlightened us, especially from their different faith traditions. So you join me to just thank our 
panelists today and for giving us some excellent ideas.